Thanks very much, Cathy. I'm really glad of the invitation to speak on World Diabetes Day. So here's the title, you've heard it already. Um, I really want to tell you a little bit about some of the concepts we've been working with first and then go and tell you about some of the results of some big studies. Maybe some of you have even participated in some of these and some of the things that we're working on and are, are getting up and going now. Um, so I'm really glad to see a full room and, and interested, eager people. Now, you might be saying to yourself, what's a gut doctor doing talking to a bunch of people who are interested in diabetes? And I hope I can convince you that the gut is really central to uh, diabetes control, both in terms of controlling blood glucose and, of course, in appetite control and controlling weight. So here are the elements that we want to look at. If you think about it, the stomach's really important because when you eat a meal, it gets stored in the stomach and the stomach's incredibly intelligent. It's, it regulates the emptying of the nutrients, including the carbs, and how fast they empty from the stomach is one of the critical determinants of that spike in blood glucose that you get after a meal. So gastric emptying, very important. Uh, controls food entry into the small intestine where it gets digested and absorbed. And one of the really important interactions between food and the gut is it causes the release of some hormones from the gut. And we now know that these are really important in blood glucose and appetite control. You might have heard of one of these hormones called GLP-1, partly because we've now got some treatments that mimic its action. So you might have heard of Bieta or Bidurion, they're injectable treatments for type 2 diabetes. They work in the same way as this hormone. There's another hormone called GIP, which is also relevant, and these hormones boost your secretion of insulin once you eat a meal, so they're really crucial. GLP-1 also affects how much glucose your liver is putting out after a meal. It suppresses that, and that's another factor that lowers that blood glucose spike. It slows the further emptying of the stomach, so it's just putting the brakes on your emptying more carbs for absorption. And it also reduces your appetite. So if you're eating less, that's going to help control blood glucose and it's going to control weight as well. So these things are really important. And there's some other hormones which I won't talk about, which are also particularly relevant to appetite <coughs> control. Enteroendocrine cells don't be worried by a long word, they're cells that are in the lining of the gut and they, they're the things that secrete hormones. And what we're really interested in is how we can find substances that stimulate these cells so that we can get the benefits of those hormones that I've shown you. And we're starting to understand a lot more about what sets these cells off. So you've got different nutrients, of course, that trigger hormones. And we now know that there's particular things called receptors on these endocrine cells. And if the proteins or the fats or the carbohydrates bind with different types of receptors, they will stimulate the release of hormones. So uh, nutrients, uh, this is one of the ways in which the body responds to them. One of the really exciting things, and some of you may have heard a little bit about this before, is that we now know that another kind of receptor present on these cells is taste receptors. You know about the taste receptors on your tongue, things like sweet, bitter, sour. Uh, you've also got those in your gut. Little cells lining the small intestine can respond to sweet or bitter tasting substances with potentially the release of these hormones. So I'm going to tell you a bit about that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later in the talk about how we might focus on those taste receptors that are in the gut. Because if we can put the right kind of taste in, in the contents of the gut, we might be able to use that to stimulate gut hormones for beneficial effect. Now, I said one of the things that sets these cells off and secretes hormones is nutrients. And some of you might have heard me talk in the past about whey protein. And we've done quite a bit of work looking at whey shakes that you drink before a meal to try and use that to control blood glucose and appetite responses. So because they're given before a meal, we call them preloads. Now, what is whey? 
Well, it comes from this beast. It's a byproduct of cheese manufacture. It used to be thrown down the drain, believe it or not. Bodybuilders have got into it because it's a great source of protein and you wouldn't believe it, the price of whey has skyrocketed in the last couple of decades. But still, it's a potentially very useful substance and one that we thought we might be able to use to stimulate these gut hormones and get a beneficial response. Back about uh, seven or eight years ago, we published this paper in a journal called Diabetes Care. It was in a small number of people with type 2 diabetes and it looked at giving a bit of whey protein, about 50 grams, in a beef flavoured soup half an hour before a mashed potato meal. So there was the preload soup and it either contained whey or it didn't contain whey and then 30 minutes later this mashed potato meal and we put a nuclear medicine label in that meal so that if we sat people in front of our special gamma camera we could track how quickly the meal was emptying from the stomach and we had a little needle in the vein that we could take blood samples with and measure the blood glucose and the hormones being released into the bloodstream. And what you can see in this study was that in the red is the re blood glucose response that people had to the mashed potato meal if they didn't have whey in their beef soup. And in the blue, you can see a much flatter, lower blood glucose response if you had some whey protein in that soup. So as a one-off, this looks like a great treatment to limit your blood glucose spike in diabetes. But there's some issues that we might have with it. I mean, we're improving blood glucose on the one hand, but the cost is that we're giving people more food, more nutrient intake to do that, and that might not be a good thing in the long term. So there are really some challenges that we had to sort out with this approach. Could we minimise the protein dose? 50, 50 grams of protein is quite a big load if you're going to give it before several meals a day. Could we use a lower dose? And the other issue is, would this work long term? It works as a one-off, but what if you kept doing this every day for a few weeks? Would it, would it wear out? Would it lose its effect? These were important things to establish. So we were really fortunate to get some funding from the uh, federal government uh, scheme, the NHMRC, and we conducted a trial. And as I say, some of you may have in fact participated in this, and we used a product that had only 20 grams of whey in it, and it also had something called guar gum. Guar gum is something that can be used to thicken liquids, and it kind of uh, helps in our process by making things a bit more viscous, slowing the emptying from the stomach. So those two things together we thought would be a good mix and it's something that's available as a commercial product. And we got people to use this product twice a day, 15 minutes before meals. Usually it was before breakfast and the evening meal and we, they did it for 12 weeks. So really quite a long-term intervention. We wanted to see if people could stick with that and did it still work. Now, some of you may have been involved in clinical trials before. It's quite a process to, uh, to work through these things. We had just over 400 people that expressed interest in participating, and we're really grateful to Diabetes SA for helping with our publicity in this process. 160-odd people actually came into our laboratory and had uh, some questionnaires and some screens to see if they met the, uh, met the criteria and some of them weren't suitable for this trial because trials always have a few restrictions different from the real world. But in the end, almost 100 people uh, were randomly assigned to get uh, either the, the whey treatment or what we call a placebo that didn't have whey in it. What was really impressive was that most people were able to stick with it. In fact, uh, people took about 95% of the prescribed number of sachets through this 12-week trial. I was amazed. I thought that was terrific. There were a very small number of people who dropped out. A few people who had the way seemed to get loose bowel actions, which was a little bit of a surprise, uh, and they couldn't go on with it. But that was very much a minority. 
There were a few, as always, in a trial where um, things crop up in the 12 weeks. They need to go away. Uh, something happens in the family. So there's always a few dropouts. But we had 79 people who completed, and 37 of those were in the active treatment group, and 42 had what we call the placebo. This was the characteristics of the people we studied. A more or less a, a roughly even split between males and females. People were about mid-60s in age on average. And if you look at what we call the body mass index, is that a, a concept that you've heard of before? We think of um, between 25 and 30 as being what's called overweight, and over 30 gets that nasty term obese. So people were sort of sitting around that overweight kind of range. They'd had diabetes for around five years. And we wanted people whose diabetes control was already reasonably good. We didn't want people who really needed urgently to be on other drug therapy. So you'll see that if you know what the HbA1c is, some of you will have that measured every so often by your doctors. It was about six and a half or just over, which is actually pretty good control. And again, about half were treated with diet alone and about half were receiving metformin treatment. We got the participants to come into the lab for three different study days. They came in for a baseline visit before they'd had any preloads. They came in and had another study on the first day of their preload treatment. And then they came in right at the end of the 12 weeks and had a study at the end of the 12 weeks of treatment. And what we did was to give them the treatment 15 minutes before the meal, as they would if they did it at home. And the meal, again, was this mashed potato meal. You may say, well, that's not what I normally eat, and it probably isn't. But it's really important for this kind of thing to have a standardised meal that we know how it behaves, and we can compare changes over time. We didn't want to use the nuclear medicine technique. We wanted something that could be repeated lots of times and was a bit quicker and easier to do. So you can put a label in this mashed potato and take breath samples uh, every so often after the meal. And we can calculate from measurement of the breath how quickly that meal has left the stomach, which is a really nice technique. We also took blood samples to measure blood glucose and also the hormones that I've talked about. So at the visit before they'd had any preload, you can see that the people in the two groups were very well matched with their blood glucose response to that mashed potato meal. It goes up quite high, doesn't it? You know, on average, a peak of 13 or 14. This was their response to the first dose of the preload, and you can see that the people who had the preload had a more delayed rise in their blood glucose, but also the peak was lower. And it was you know, around one millimole per litre lower. Not a huge amount, but enough to be relevant. Did that persist after doing this twice a day for 12 weeks? Well, we were really relieved to find that, yes, it did. It seemed to be just as good an effect at the end of 12 weeks as it was on day one. So that was really a, a terrific result. Did it slow gastric emptying? Well, you can see at week one, the breath test told us that the people who'd had the active preload did have slightly slower emptying of the mashed potato than the people who hadn't. And again, that effect persisted at 12 weeks. So it didn't wear off. It kept doing its job of slowing the emptying of the meal from the stomach. So again, this was great news. Now, a lot of people who do diabetes research will say, well, hang on a moment, what happened to their HbA1c? So this was always going to be difficult to change because they had quite a low HbA1c when they started. But what we found was in the, in the group that had whey, you can see in the red that their HbA1c went down by about 0.1 in 12 weeks, whereas the group that didn't have the whey they actually went up slightly over that time. So it's a difference between those two groups, which is small, but definitely there. And this was also an important thing to measure. What happened to weight? We were giving these people an extra 40 grams of protein a day. Were they going to put on weight, even though that improved their blood glucose responses? And again, we're relieved to find that no, they didn't. Both groups 
pretty much stayed exactly the same as far as their weight goes. Now, what we think is that that bit of whey before a meal just slightly suppresses your appetite and you're inclined, what we say is compensate, you're inclined to compensate for that when you come to eat your meal. So no weight gain over 12 weeks. So we think that these whey shakes in people who've got pretty well controlled diabetes, they do seem to slow emptying, lower the blood glucose response and slightly reduce that HbA1c and they don't induce weight gain. So this is exciting news and I think the uh, question that has to be worked out in the future is uh, are other groups of people with diabetes going to benefit from this? We wouldn't necessarily say that this is the be all and end all. People with not so well controlled diabetes will need other treatments. But for people with mild diabetes, this is something useful that, that uh, holds some potential. Now, I spent some time early on talking about these taste receptors in the gut. And one of the things that they can taste is sweet tastes. And uh, you think about how appealing sweet taste is. Could we use these sweet taste receptors to uh, achieve some gains? And um, you know that uh, sugar and calorie containing sweet things aren't the only sweet things. You, you know about artificial sweetness, of course. And what would be the effect if we were to give people artificial sweeteners that wouldn't have any calorie load at all, but they might still have beneficial effects in the gut, that'd be a nice idea. This slide is just to show you that these things are present in the human gut. These are actually some biopsies that we've taken by putting a thin little endoscope down into the uh, top part of the small intestine and taking a tiny little snip of tissue. And one of my science colleagues has put it under the microscope and he's used special stains to show these cells lighting up on the little finger-like projections of the small intestine. Gus Juicin is one of the components of the taste, sweet taste receptor, and you can see that in the red, there's a stain that picks that up in the bowel lining. In the green, we're picking up that important hormone GLP-1, and then in that composite image, you can see that the two seem to coincide. So some of those cells that secrete GLP-1 have got sweet taste receptor apparatus. So we might be onto something here. Now, people like to make a lot of conclusions in science from what they can find in mice. But you might like to know if this sweet taste apparatus is important, what would happen to a mouse that didn't have it? Would it secrete these gut hormones normally? And uh, in the green, you see what happens when you give a glucose load to a normal mouse. It secretes GLP-1 over time on the left, and it secretes insulin on the right. And in the red, that's a mouse that's been bred specifically not to have that taste apparatus in the gut. And you can see it doesn't secrete so much of that GLP-1 hormone, and it's got a rather abnormal insulin response. So. Um, could we stimulate this GLP-1 and stimulate insulin secretion by giving people sweet tasting things? You're aware, as I say, of some of these artificial sweeteners. The, the one we chose for our study was Splendo, it's, or sucralose is the, the name of that product. You'll find it in a number of artificially sweetened products uh, on the shelves. And what we did in this case was study some healthy volunteers. These were people without diabetes. And we wanted to compare a few different things in each individual. So we got them to come to our laboratory on four separate days. And the things we wanted to compare, we wanted to compare normal table sugar. So that tastes sweet, but it's got calories in it. We wanted to compare that with a low dose of that artificial sweetness sucralose. We also compared a really high dose, something like that was 10 times what you'd normally put if you were sweetening your meal with artificial sweetener. And we also built into this experiment another day where they got something quite inert, saline or salty water. So that's called a control. Now in this instance, we didn't want people to know which they were getting. So we actually put a really fine little tube down the nose and into the stomach and we injected these liquids directly into their stomach and then took out the tube. 
And we used that breath test technique again to look at how quickly those liquids were emptying from the stomach. And we took blood samples to look at blood glucose and hormone responses. And in a nutshell, with the hormones, this is what we found. Sucrose in the yellow, which is table sugar, that produces a really good response for the hormone G GIP and GLP-1. Uh, we already knew that it would do that, so it's what we call a positive control. What we found, though, was that neither the low dose nor the high dose of that sucralose really had any effect to stimulate either of those hormones. So that's a little bit disappointing. It tells us that it doesn't look like these are going to be the go as far as getting a free, you know, free ride for boosting hormones but not having calories. And indeed, when we looked at whether any of these things were slowing gastric emptying, well, the, the table sugar load, the sucrose, that emptied slower than everything else. But the sucralose, whether it was in a small or a large dose, it didn't have any difference in how fast it emptied from the stomach compared to the saline. So these things really didn't seem to be doing much on their own for gut hormones. So that's a bit of a disappointment, a bit of a dead end. What we're excited about now, though, is that there's also sweet, uh, there's also apparatus in the gut for bitter taste. And if you think about it, bitter things are things in our environment that uh, our body is telling us, hey, just be careful of that. Now, coffee is a kind of pleasant bitter thing, but think about green vegetables like um, broccoli and how infants don't like them because they're bitter. It's a natural thing to say, hmm, bitter things might be poisonous, better reject those. And in fact, the body, the gut does that as well. If you put bitter things in your gut, your gut is supposed to reject them and uh, not want to take them in. So could you actually harness that to get some reduction of appetite, some weight loss and some blood glucose improvements? And this is just another one of those staining slides in biopsies from the gut to show that the bitter taste receptors are there and they seem to line up with some of those cells that secrete that GLP-1 hormone. So there might be some potential in this. Now, BTR just stands for bitter taste receptor. And there's a, there's a, what we call an agonist is something that stimulates those bitter taste receptors. And you'll see in this slide a reference to something called DB. It stands for denatonium benzoate. Just call it DB. It's that stuff in bottles of poisonous materials. And if you were to taste them, you would find it's the most bitter stuff that you've ever, uh, you've ever tasted in your life. And it's in there because the manufacturers want you, if you accidentally drink it, particularly if a child drinks it, to taste this intense bitter and to want to spit it out. So that's DB or denatonium benzoate. Now, if you give this to a mouse, you can see this is quite exciting. It, it stimulates that GLP-1 hormone. Uh, so that's quite uh, fruitful. Um, and uh, this might be something that we can use. But we've seen this, of course, before with those sweet taste receptors. It does also seem to slow the emptying from the stomach in mice. So again, this is what we want to do if we want to lower blood glucose after meals. And here's the blood glucose profile in mice who have been given this DB. And you can see in the red, it's quite a bit lower than when they've been given saline. So again, this is something that might hold some weight. So what do we know about human studies that have used these bitter taste receptor agonists? There are a few of them around, but not many. They've all been done in healthy subjects, not in people with diabetes. The only studies are sort of one-off exposures. There's not a lot of stuff about people using these repeatedly, and the doses have been quite low. Usually people have put a tube down into the stomach and given them that way, or they've given them in capsules. And the results of all this really have been quite inconsistent. So it's hard to know so far what to make of it. We've done a little work with this denatonium benzoate, DB, in our laboratory so far. And we started off with healthy volunteers. And we gave them uh, either um, just water, 
or we put a tube into the top of the small intestine and infuse doses of DB and we used a 10 milligram dose or a 30 milligram dose. And what you see here is a hormone called ghrelin and ghrelin's a hormone that stimulates appetite. And you can see that for the low dose of DB, that suppressed the ghrelin levels and even more so with the higher dose. So if you've got less ghrelin in your system, you will tend to have a lower appetite. So that might be a good thing. Same experiment, we also measured how much of that hormone GLP-1 they're making. And you can see that with the low dose of DB, that did actually stimulate a little bit of GLP-1 production and the higher dose stimulated even more. So again, this is really promising in humans, different from what we saw with the artificial sweeteners. Once we'd infused that DB or saline into the gut of these volunteers, Sometime later, we offered them a buffet meal and they were invited to eat as much as they wanted over 30 minutes from this big selection of food. This is a standard sort of technique when you want to look at effects on appetite. You can see that if they were just given water, they ate quite a large number of kilojoules. These are all uh, fit young people generally who've got uh, healthy appetites. A low dose of DB actually suppressed their intake a little bit and the higher dose resulted in them eating 20% fewer kilojoules in that buffet meal than the water. So this really seemed to be quite appealing to us. Um, but you know, you can't um, get by with a treatment that needs to be infused through a tube that goes into the small intestine, can you? You can, but it's not very practical. So we were really interested, first of all, to test this in people with type 2 diabetes, but also to do it in a capsule form, something that's encapsulated. You can swallow the capsule. Because it's got a, a, an outer coating, you won't be able to taste the bitter, and it won't release until it gets down into your gut. And we wanted to study the stomach emptying. We wanted to study what it did to blood glucose after a meal and what it did to people's appetite and energy intake. So we studied 16 people with type 2 diabetes, even split between men and women. Like the last WAY trial I showed you, people on average were in their mid-60s and they had that BMI of around 30. Again, they had quite well-controlled diabetes if you're looking at HbA1c and they'd had their diabetes for roughly six years. And some of them were on diet alone and some of them were metformin treated, about half and half. And we had two different elements to this study. Part A, we wanted to look at the blood glucose response to a standard meal. And this is quite like what you've seen before. They had that capsule containing 30 milligrams of DB, 30 minutes before the mashed potato meal. And just like you saw previously, we labelled that meal with the substance that enables us to track its emptying by taking breath samples. Then on another day, they had part B, which was an appetite study. They had the same capsule of DB, and 30 minutes later they were offered that buffet meal. Lots of appealing foods. You're allowed to eat and drink whatever you like for 30 minutes, and we count how much of different kinds of foods have been consumed. So did these capsules slow the emptying of the potato meal from the stomach? Well, this is a bit disappointing, isn't it? There's absolutely no difference there. Did they lower the blood glucose response? Well, this is even more disappointing, isn't it? They didn't seem to do much to that, and that's probably because they didn't slow the stomach emptying. So we sh perhaps shouldn't be entirely surprised about that. But don't lose heart completely because here's what happened with the buffet meal, the food intake. And you can see if you look at the weight of what they ate or its energy value, these did work to suppress energy intake. About a 10% reduction in how many kilojoules they consumed at that buffet meal. So this is actually quite exciting. We haven't published these findings yet. We've presented them at an international meeting recently, but there's a lot of excitement in this area and I think you'll hear some more about this.
So in summary, for this study, well-controlled type 2 diabetes, these orally administered capsules of DB don't affect stomach emptying or blood glucose responses, but do suppress energy intake. So we think the stimulation of these intestinal bitter taste receptors does have a bit of mileage in the management of either obesity or type 2 diabetes. And it's something that we've got a series of studies that we're going to take further and investigate this and really work out how to exploit this to maximum potential. Now, last of all, I want to just tell you a little bit about where we're working. Some of you may have been there. We've got this thing now in Adelaide called the Biomedical Precinct. And if you've been a little bit further west along North Terrace, you'll see it in action now. Um, our building, the University of Adelaide there, is next to what, what's called the cheese grater, Samri. That shows, in fact, another building called Samri 2 that's not there yet. They have to move the railway control centre before they can start building Samri 2. And then further along, you've got the wonderful new palace, the new RAH. So this is the biomedical precinct. But this is our building. It looks fantastic, doesn't it? We do our studies on level four of this building. It's got beautiful views out over North Terrace, but more importantly, these beautiful people that work with us, some of you know, Michelle and Jackie. Here's Michelle and Jackie um, giving some delicious food to a, a volunteer who's come in. And if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing at the moment, um, certainly without committing yourself, but just for more information, we've got an email address uh, and a phone number where you can either talk to someone or leave a message and we can get back to you. And I think um, uh, Jackie and Michelle have left some uh, information on seats that you're very welcome to pursue. This is not just my work. I need to thank people who are involved with it. Some of you may know Michael Horowitz, who's uh, one of the, the leaders of our broader research group, uh, and my colleagues Karen Jones, Tong Zhu Wu and Richard Young. Linda Watson, some of you might know. Linda's an endocrinologist who is doing her PhD, particularly on the whey protein work. Kong and Xu Yi are here today. They're PhD students. Now, the slides that didn't look very good, they were my slides, but the slides that had really fancy animations in them, they were Kong's. And Kong is the best designer of slides I've ever found. So you might want to say hello to Kong at the end. And last of all, uh, Michelle and Jackie, we couldn't work without them and they're doing a terrific job. And there's the, that's for historic purposes only, Diabetes SA logo, it should be updated. But we've had a lot of support from various groups for which we're very grateful. But most of all, we're grateful for people with type 2 diabetes and also healthy volunteers without whom we couldn't do any of this stuff. So um, it, with regard to our studies, type 2 patients we're very happy to hear from, but also if you're a relative or you know people who don't have diabetes, we're very interested to hear from you too because we do things with healthy people as well. So thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.